Hi. Hi all. Ray Friends has detailed for the last few pages the breath of fresh air going through headquarters in the mid 70s from around 76 to 78 when the governing body was actually inviting input on the advisability of continuing with their field service policies and their field service reports. But he's making the case and going on with it in the next segment that the traditions of the Watchtower had already fossilized. They'd hardened into mm. a solid mass that you couldn't penetrate. The breeze certainly, certainly wasn't going to change anything. So that was the last time, Ray Franz says, that that kind of input was welcome, even though it was ignored totally. Mm -hmm. So in this section, setting up works of law. When the Apostle Paul wrote about salvation not being dependent on works, it was frequently in the context of law and works of law. Does this alter the picture above set out? No, for the reason that for Jehovah's Witnesses, the works they are constantly urged to perform have become to all intents and purposes, works prescribed by law. Human, organizational law, but still law. The Greek term for law, nomos, used in scripture, applies not only to written laws in a legal sense, but very broadly to any norm, rule, custom, usage, or tradition. That being a direct quote from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which we've shown you on this channel before. Somewhat similarly, in, in English, law is defined as a binding custom or practice of a community, a rule of conduct or action prescribed or formally recognized as binding or enforced by a controlling authority. That from Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary. The binding nature of the works prescribed by the controlling authority of the Watchtower organization, not only as regards field service to be for, performed in the, in the formally recognized way, but also as to regularity of attendance at the five weekly meetings is evident. These may not be formally stated as laws, but they are formally recognized as binding obligations on all members. The witness is made to feel guilt before God if he or she does not adhere to the organization's prescribed program of activity. This combined with peer pressure provides the means of, for the controlling authority to enforce the performance of these works. We have seen the genesis of the witnesses door-to-door -door activity and that in course of time this activity came to be presented as an essential rule for all faithful loyal witnesses, a divinely imposed duty. Fulfillment of this was presented as necessary to gain God's favor and approval failure to perform it would result in blood guilt. The text in Ezekiel 3, 18 and 19 frequently being used to support this view. This is undeniably the way the vast majority of witnesses view the matter to this day. Similar to the ancient pattern of the nation of Israel under the law code, a structured program of weekly service activity began to be set out for them to perform, and they came to feel that their regularity in performing this was evidence of their righteousness before God. And he makes reference to Luke 18, verses 11 and 12. In more recent times, the incredible dogmatic viewpoints presented during Rutherford's time are rarely stated so brashly in such crass terms. Yet the same basic idea is regularly expressed in a more subtle, sophisticated matter, manner. The ultimate effect of imposing a sense of guilt on those not complying with all organization, organizational arrangements is still achieved. The emphasis on door-to-door -door activity soon converted that work into a primary standard for determining whether a man qualified for eldership. The book Faith on the March, which we alluded to in a prior segment by A. H. McMillan, one of the headquarters staff in the Rutherford era, Faith on the March on page 158 says of those who were congregational elders during the 1920s and early 1930s, quote, those who refused to swallow their pride and follow the example of Jesus and his disciples in the door-to-door -door ministry soon found themselves out of the organization entirely. They soon found that all the others of their 
respective congregations were participating in the witness work which developed them mentally and otherwise brought them to maturity. These active ones became true elders by reason of their loyalty and zeal in the Lord's service. They were not elected to an office of elder, but they became elders by their own service activity. Then they were appointed to positions of responsibility and service in the organization because they had shown the proper qualifications. End of Macmillan quote. In setting out qualifications for men who render service of oversight in a congregation, the Apostle Paul said nothing of door-to-door -door witnessing activity. But this now became a major rule for judging the qualifications of all witness men who would serve in that capacity to determine if they should be organizationally appointed. In practice, it became a law enforced by the controlling authority. The law governed congregational appointments, and it remains so today. It is a well-known fact that when elders in a congregation receive notice of the visit of a society representative, circuit or district overseer, in almost all cases their thoughts immediately go to their personal field service report and whether it will be met with approval. They rarely think of the spiritual qualifications or qualities the apostles set out in scripture for those who do shepherding of the flock. We should make reference to the two scriptures that Ray cited at the top of page 202. One being the Ezekiel one that you hear frequently if you're a witness. Ezekiel mm -hmm. is told that it is the duty of the watchman to warn those who are sinning. Mm -hmm. Because if they go on sinning and die, at least he, the watchman, Ezekiel, will have saved his soul. But the soul that is sinning will die. And that is therefore, his guilt is upon himself, but his guilt is also on you if you don't warn him. Yeah, so you're blood guilty if you don't do the witnessing work. So what's the application? Why is the application of that wrong, though? misguided? Well, it never seems to occur to us when we're witnesses that Ezekiel was the prophet and the one man. He wasn't the whole nation. So from the, from that way of thinking, really it's the anointed, or the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the FDS and the faithful, the governing body that should be, doing, yeah, yeah. should be doing the work, not the, the uh, average Israelite. So he, you're, he wasn't doing this work. Yeah, you could say by extension, okay, the principle, but no, the direct application of it to you because you don't do door-to-door -door ministry, you're blood guilty, and, th and they do believe that. Yeah. The average witness takes that very seriously. Yeah. But then there's, he makes the point about Luke 18, the two men who go up to the, the temple. Mm -hmm. Which one is the Jehovah's Witness? The, the man who says, as he looks up to heaven in the temple, I thank you that I am not like other men, I do this and I do that. And he talks about how much he ties and you know all the activities he does in his uh, service to God. To show his faithfulness. Yeah. And that Christ contrasts in Luke 18 to the other man who can't even lift, a, lift up his eyes in mm -hmm. the temple. Yeah, it says, be merciful to me, uh, a sinner. So how how sinful he was and how faithful he was in some ways, we don't know. It's, that's yeah. irrelevant. Christ is saying, which one of these two men went home Justified. declared righteous? Yeah. The one who thought he was righteous or the, th the one who thought of himself as a sinner? Yeah. So one is boasting about his works and thinking his works are saving him. And the other one recognizes himself. He, he knows himself. He's, he's self-aware. Uh, you know, how often do you hear a witness say, be merciful to me, I am a sinner. I never heard anybody say that. I never said it. And how often do you even think of the people you're meeting that way, that I should be merciful to them, sinners? And that God... We don't even talk about sin. That's true. Very much as witnesses. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's not a concept you're really focused on. And if you don't 
ask God for his mercy for yourself and your sins, mm -hmm. it only makes sense and it's consistent. You're not going to ask him to be merciful to other sinners. Yeah. And you don't. You feel pride in, in you're different than them and you're doing this work and you're doing, yeah. uh, you know, what witnesses do and that makes you righteous. Yeah. In the next segment, Ray analyzes the prioritizing of service arrangements and field service and reports and what that does to the spirituality and the shepherding ability of the average Jehovah's Witness elder. Mm -hmm.